Welcome to season two of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. This podcast is produced by Beautiful Teaching. Our goal is to immerse you into the beauty of good teaching. Our formative sessions are designed to be live, so you can experience classical education through participating and doing. Join our consultant, Benjamin Lida, who has years of experience in Charlotte Mason schools, traditional classical schools, and homeschooling. Immerse yourself in classical writing lessons, learning rudimentary exercises from the Pro Gymnasmata for eight weeks. This course is ideal and practical for both home educators and classroom teachers. You will come away with a newfound joy and a love of writing that you can extend to your students without purchasing a curriculum. The Pro Gymnasmata is fun, beautiful, and leads to deep and reflective writing like nothing you've ever experienced. The truest to classical writing, the Pro Gymnasmata lays the foundation for formal writing and thinking habits. You can register for this course and see all of the other ones we're offering at beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. Again, beautifulteaching at coursestorm.com. You can also email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. So today we are here with two delightful teachers from a school in Austin that I recently visited called Longview. Longview School is a learner-centered school, but it is not learner-centered in the way many of us think learner-centered being Montessori or progressive. But when I walked in this school, I felt like I was in the school of Athens. I felt like I was watching Plato uh, coaching his students at the school of Athens. And I, I really was excited to um, learn how, how to learn math. Like, so I really wanted to get them on the show because I think this discussion is important. We have many things we agree on about how math should be taught and how the student should be respected as a learner. And um, so what I'd like to do is first have uh, Kaylee and Kevin introduce themselves, give a little bit of background about themselves, and then we'll dive into some really great questions. So Kaylee, would you mind? Sure. Um, I'm Kaylee White, and I am a math teacher here at Longview. I've been teaching here for five years, and um, I've studied actually when I first came to the school under Kevin um, and spent some time studying and learning from him, being part of his learning community, and then eventually moving to having my, my own group of learners as well. Okay, Kevin? I'm Kevin Moore. I'm one of the co-founders of Longview. Um, I've been with Longview, but well, Longview has been open for about eight years. Um, in that time, um, I've also taught mathematics at Longview, in addition to, you know, um, other um, leadership roles um, in the school. But um, I've been teaching for uh, almost three decades, um, and um, Longview has provided an opportunity, really, for me to do a lot of the things in education that I could not do before. So um, Longview has been an exciting opportunity to see me realize the kind of um, educational environments that I have always wanted to work in. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you for coming on the show today. We would both agree that the Mathematician's Lament by Lockhart is an important work in discussing the problems with math and how it's approached in in schools today and in textbooks. And um, that book is kind of where I want to start since we all agree that this is a great, a great book to uh, start diving into these topics with. So in his book, The Mathematician's Lament, he opens with these two hypothetical scenarios of a music teacher and an art teacher's nightmare. And he paints this picture of how devastating it would be, or actually it is, if we taught these arts with state assessed standards and how it would kill the love of being a musical and artistic person. And then he closes the first chapter lamenting 
If I had to design a mechanism for the express purpose of destroying a child's natural curiosity and love of pattern making, I couldn't possibly do as good a job as is currently being done. I simply wouldn't have the imagination to come up with the kind of senseless, soul-crushing ideas that constitute contemporary mathematics and education. Everyone knows that something is wrong, and the only people who understand what is going on are the ones most often blamed and least often heard, the students. They say math class is stupid and boring, and they are right. And in the next chapter, he opens by saying, the first thing to understand is the teaching mathematics is an art. So I would like to hear your responses to this because it's clear to me that you all agree with this and you get it. Please tell us about your prop about the problems that you guys have seen in how math is taught today and what Longview has developed as a solution to helping students discover the wonder, the beauty, and frankly, the electrifying power that math can bring into the young minds who are dying to explore and discover. Because when I visited your school, it was electric and it was interesting and the students were very engaged and I was engaged. <laughs> so share with us your heart on all of this. Okay, so um, we believe one of the uh, biggest uh, problems that we have to um, address in education has mainly to do with the assumptions that we have for children. And um, we just believe that children can do complex work and and the and embracing the complexity of that work is what makes it meaningful. But I, I think that in education, there is this um, misunderstanding or oversimplification of the stages of, of human development, which um, in these stages of human development, the early stages are often um, described as being uh, concrete stages where children aren't able to wrestle with or grapple with complex ideas. But at Longview, we believe um, the antithesis of that. We believe that children want to, and we believe that what they need and able to be able to wrestle with that and find themselves doing meaningful work is to have experiences created for them to be able to participate in that kind of meaningful work. So at Longview, we believe that our goal is to create the kinds of experiences where that where learners can actually uh, begin to grapple with really complex ideas and find their way through those ideas and do that within a community of learners um, where they are working together to do that work and the teacher is facilitating um, all the time, uh, not necessarily uh, dictating what should be happening, but for the most part, providing the kind of challenge and mediating through those challenges. Well, thank you for that. and. I should say up front, and our listeners know that that Adrian and I are oftentimes trying to rethink uh, the ways in which the classical education renewal movement, in particular, has wrestled with uh, the way we think about stages of development and how that relates to what we do in the classroom. And I think as we go back to the sources and we, you know, to, to go back to Adrian's introduction, kind of look at what was going on uh, during the classical period, or if we read some of these. Um, original sources that are really at the heart of the tradition, we find that um, perhaps it's not clearly as aligned with certain stages of development as later uh, readers of the tradition or practitioners um, have, have made it out to be. And so I think there, there's some, some things that we could discuss there. I want to clarify two words that you used several times throughout the course of your description, and those two words are complex and meaningful. So if you could just spend a bit more time and uh, you know, Miss White, if you want to jump in on this, when you think about complex work, uh, what do you mean by that? And then, and then, what what is meaningful work in in your understanding? Well, uh, definitely complex for us is work that has learn that pushes learners to really grapple to um, consider um, their previous experiences um, to um, challenge. Um, understandings that they already have. Um, and while having those understandings challenge, they're developing new ways of thinking or deeper understandings of the things that they already know. So for us, the complexity comes with learners having to really um, uh, to grapple, to grapple, but not only just uh, to grapple, but to have um, 
you know, real challenges in the way that they they see the world, um, things that they have uh, already come to accept as truth or um, things that they um, have somehow um, uh, come to believe as a fact. So now that they are challenged with something that pushes them to reconsider that information, then um, they have to come to develop new understandings. And so I think the complexity is just having the challenge of being, um, uh, having to contend with something that causes you to reconsider that which you've already attained. And, and to build and to connect back to Adrian, your original question, and, and also thank you, your words, as you were reflecting on your experience in the classroom was, I think you said electric and engaged. And really that is, to me, that is the opposite of, you know, the feelings that, or the words that I would have associated with the experience that learners might've been having where I came from, which was a very typical um, school environment where the teachers are working at their very hardest as, you know, at, you know teachers from those environments working at the very hardest, but they're contending with this system um, of a, you know, a typical school environment where your goals are now making sure your standards are posted, that you're covering your content. Um, and it really, I, I, you know, this theme of oversimplifying um, really kind of shines through it because we're just using simply our textbooks, you're kind of constrained by all of that. And so, you know, even though these teachers are working at their very hardest, it's, you know, that's that's a difficult, you know, um, thing to have to deal with. When instead, to me, this idea of complexity is in the discipline itself, that mathematics itself is complex and rich and interesting and challenging. And that when we allow for the discipline to, um, you know, be all that it is, and allow for students to experience all that it is that you don't have to have, you know, fancy games or extra ways of remembering different strategies and procedures, um, adding on just so many things to try to, you know, elevate engagement because for whatever reason, mathematics has become, you know, this hated or dreaded subject um, and instead, to us, what, I, what I've learned through being at Longview is that the discipline itself is valuable and interesting and can be, um, you know, the reason for interesting discussions. And that when you engage young learners um, together, thinking about it as this is an effort that we together are trying to, you know, grapple with and figure out, that that is a, that leads to agency, that learners are really going to be engaged and the feelings that you're going to be having are these words that you're using, Adrian, electric, yeah. engaged, all of that is gonna come forth because I, I really think that that's what I've learned is that the discipline itself is the complexity. It is the interesting thing. That's right. In fact, I, I have one more quote from the mathematician's lament that I think bridges into what we're saying here. He says, mathematics is the music of reason. To do mathematics is to engage in an act of discovery and conjecture, intuition and inspiration, to be in a state of confusion, not because it makes no sense to you, but because you gave it sense and you still don't understand what your creation is up to. Have a breakthrough idea, to be frustrated as an artist, to be awed and overwhelmed by an almost painful beauty, to be alive. And that's what I saw happening in your students when I was at Longview. And I, I, I guess I'd like you guys to kind of get into the nitty gritty even about how, how you implement, in, implement instruction, because it's very, very different than I, the way I've ever seen math taught ever. It is the way I think all classical schools should be teaching math because it was very Socratic. Um, it was mimetic, which is uh, part of the Aristotelian tradition, um, meaning just imitation. And I know that you what you guys do as teachers is, is mimetic instruction. You model, you coach, you have good communication and clear rules in your classroom for how to talk to one another. And you talk to your students the same way you expect them to talk to one another. And I, I'd love for you guys to kind of share what some of the languages that you use back and forth with the kids. I mean, it's, it's amazing and I, very exciting. And I'd like, I'd like our listeners to hear some of that. 
Well, I think as Kaylee had mentioned, we allow the discipline to be the work. Um, mm -hmm. The learners are engaged as mathematicians. That's our goal. That's our true. goal is to engage them as mathematicians. Um, but even more importantly, we're engaging them as learners. So we are learning alongside them. And so for us, what's most important isn't the teaching. It's really the learning. And um, so if we are learning alongside them um, and we're allowing the discipline to be what it is, which is a complex network of ideas um, that learners are grappling with and having discussions, trying to figure out, trying to make connections, um, it, it gets messy. Um, and it and we we want it to be messy because um, in the messiness, something will emerge from the messiness, which usually is understanding. And from that understanding, learners um, are going to have a, a deeper understanding of the mathematics for sure. But they also are learning really important ways to engage. Um, they're learning how to communicate well. And they're learning to communicate by really being precise with the language of the discipline. They're learning to work together, um, struggle really together. So they're learning to be really collaborative. Um, they're creating. Um, they're thinking critically about the content. So we're pushing them to use all of these skills that they naturally have, but the way in which we're engaging them, we're helping them to enhance those abilities. We're helping them to enhance those skills so they become even more effective at learning mathematics. That's yeah, totally and interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, yeah. if, I, if I could just interject, uh, and, and perhaps Ms. White, if, if you want to reflect on this, this comment, I wonder, you know, we think a lot about the fact that um, students are not oftentimes asked to actually engage the art of whatever um, practitioner, um, you know, what does a mathematician do if you're in a math class? Or what does a historian do when you're in a history class? And so as a literature teacher um, and as a history teacher, I think a lot about, you know, how can I get you um, in, in an age appropriate way uh, for this particular setting with the group of students I have in front of me to be as much of a historian as, as you can be, or much of a, you know, or a literary critic, you know, if you're reading this, um, or, or more importantly in literature, um, just in a human being, right? Someone who enjoys uh, what literature has to offer and what those stories give us. Um, so I'd like to hear more about the art of the mathematician. What, what is that? What does a mathematician do? Well, I, I think that for us, we think about community and that what we're asking our learners to do is to present arguments and really engage in an argument, present proof for your argument and to engage in a critical discourse with a, a community. And so how that might look on a day-to-day -day is that we're all sitting in community together, considering ideas, offering, you know, conjectures or ways of thinking, but with the expectation that because you're offering something that you have to have some line of reasoning or proof that you're, that that's coming from. It's not just offhanded. It's not, well, just because we, we ask, so you, you asked earlier about long view language. And I, I think that's, it's interesting to think about because I think we do kind of have our, as we're entrenched in this culture, there's a language that kind of comes forth and things you'll often hear in a long view classroom are, I disagree, or I agree, or I need more information, or how did you think of that? And those types of prompts, not only coming from the adult in the room, but from the learners to one another in the room, because we are in a culture where as a mathematician, your job, what we're doing, the act of being a mathematician is to, you know, try to find connections and then present your arguments with proof and have that um, proof being critiqued by the other in your community that are listening in. And so as learners are at their boards presenting an argument, they might push back on one another. And all of that is part of the um, experience that we're trying to create um, in really deepening our understanding. And as Kevin said, the messiness. And so really my role as a teacher in that moment 
is to truly be a learner with them and listen so carefully. That's the, probably the biggest thing that I've learned about being at Longview is that what I'm really doing is I'm listening to everything that's happening and I'm, I'm trying to help them to listen to one another as well. And that as we do that important critical listening work um, and saying, hold on, I'm not sure that that argument was quite clear enough or I'm missing some information, it presses them to form stronger arguments and, and, it's, and it's fun. It's fun to hear them disagree with each other. So really they're engaged in this critical discourse, critical argument. And, um, and it, it, it's exciting. But I want to I want to add, it's not like... It's not like what what we may think of a critical argument. It, there's no disrespect going on. It's so beautiful. It's done so well. I don't. I didn't see any kids frustrated. I saw kindness. I saw compassion. I saw deep thinking. I saw excellent communication. I saw communication that I rarely see from children who are eight or nine years old. <laughs> Just the level of intellectual language they use. And they, they know what they're talking about. I, I just, I think it was, it's brilliant how you put a problem on the board and you just ask somebody to come up and start showing how to solve it. And so these kids have a lot of virtues that they're tapping into. They have to be brave. I mean, they have to get over fear. They all have to deal with, okay, I can't be afraid. We're all in this boat together. That's the kind of impression I got from the classroom was like, we're all in this boat together. We're all learners. And I think you guys do a really great job um, setting that atmosphere, that that atmosphere of learning as a learner and being a learner is so important. As, as I'm glad you noticed that, Adrian. I because, noticed. <laughs> yeah, it, because that is the culture. And really, and to go to what you said, we often have teachers who say to us as we work with educators that, you know, and I actually remember very specifically a teacher asking a student, well, don't you feel bad when someone says they disagree with you? Doesn't that make you feel bad? No. And, you know, it's really interesting because, yeah, because Didn't. Uh, actually I remember how uh, a, one of our learners, Alina, it was Kevin, Alina responded to this teacher by saying, well, no, they're not saying they disagree with me. It's not, it's not about me. And she, of course, said this much more eloquently than I'm saying now, but it's not about me when they're saying they disagree. It's they're, they're just disagreeing with my idea or they, they don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. And so they don't see it as, you know, I think some of that is the adult baggage. You know, if we hear, we hear it's the true. term disagreement or argument that that feels bad for us. Um, but for them, if you come from a culture where learning is a process, I mean, wouldn't we all like want that experience, right? Where it's about the, you know, going through it. It's about getting information from your community and changing. And, and that is what learning is to them. And that's well, maybe not how we experienced it, but. Right. And actually with the, with the dangers and the really bad argumentative habits that are in social media, this is, this type of teaching is even more important now. I'm, I'm a big fan of doing seminars in classrooms, you know, because they do need to learn how to restate what they've heard so that they're clearly being understood. You know, like, this is what I heard and here's what, how I see it. And they need to be able to have a dialogue about those things. And so I, I was really, I think the fact that your whole school from the top down has a very um, solid system in place on good communication is is working what, whatever you guys have and I, I'd love for you to use just expand some more like um, when when you when you start a lesson how do you do it because I mean I, I was there but our listeners have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> well it, it really goes back to um, you know when uh, the question was asked about uh, the what what is the work? How do mathematicians work? And yeah. for us, the most important aspect of the work of mathematicians is community. So for us, we've got to, it, it's so important for us to have learners understand that their debates are not with each other. Their debates are for the purpose of being able for the community to reach consensus on an idea. Mm -hmm. So they're working together for the sole purpose 
of developing a common understanding of a particular mathematical idea. So for the, for us, we're pushing toward the community aspect of this because we believe that um, when uh, individuals work together in community, they can accomplish far more than they can independently. And, and we believe that's how we, we know that's how mathematicians work. Even if a mathematician is working on something uh, individually, if they're working alone at their desk, at some point, that information has to be vetted by peers. So they belong to this community, and we're trying to keep in mind that our learners are part of a community of learners who are helping them to elevate their thinking. And the harder they, that each individual is working toward that aim, the more successful they all become. So we really believe that if learners are committed to learning as be, and being part of the community, then a lot of the things that, um, you know, would be otherwise, you know, the, the arguments and the I want to go first and those sorts of things really aren't but they don't happen here because learners understand that they are doing something much greater than just um, an individual showing their thinking or proving that they are, you know, smarter than someone else. They understand that the goal is that they are teaching each other, they are learning from each other, and for the purpose of everyone developing this common understanding of some really complex mathematical idea. So when we put a problem on the board or we pose a question, we can step back and, and, and know that our learners are committed to taking a risk just putting something out there um, and seeing where it takes them. So it's not a matter of I'm presenting this because I know I'm right. I'm presenting this because I want to at least get the community started um, with this discussion. And let's see you know, where this is going to take us. How can we evolve our thinking? So that's the kind of work that we want our learners to be engaged in. And when we talked about, and the question was asked, well, so what is meaningful? Well, that is meaningful. The, the, the point that our learners are grappling with something that they know will ultimately emerge from that will ultimately emerge understanding. And that's meaningful work. And they're doing that work together. I appreciate you tying things back to this idea of, of meaningful work, because it seems to me that unless the student perceives the what's going on in the classroom as meaningful, um, there are just too many opportunities to disengage or to, uh, to just direct their attention or concern elsewhere. And so I'm curious with all of the various uh, backgrounds that I'm sure students are approaching uh, your classroom with and all the different experiences they've had with math, do you have to work through a process with them to sort of initiate them into the culture that is Longview so that they can all work together in that community? And how, do, how does that work? Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, they do not come in um, uh, from their previous experiences ready to take risk and, you know, um, uh, 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 use this kind of language, explaining their thinking, you know, that is very, it's new for them. And I can't say that it's what we, the teachers aren't simply responsible for helping learners acclimate, the other learners help learners acclimate. Um, and it's just, um, you know, helping them to, uh, it, encouraging them to take a risk. Uh, just being who they are as learners in the community helps other learners to acclimate. So I, I it is for some learners. Um, it takes a while because they they are very observant, um, so they're hesitant before they jump in. They want to know exactly how to do this because we don't ask learners to raise our ha their hands or any of those sorts of things. So it's a very different way of learning. It, actually, it's the way that we all communicate with each other when we're not in school. <laughs> um, it's really how we are as as learners when we're not in school, but um, the learners who have, who are really aligned with their school experiences, they find it really difficult to be part of um, this kind of learning environment in school, which I find interesting. Um, but the other learners help them. And um, with time, the, those learners being really observant of what's happening and some learners who are more willing to take risks, they will, um, they accelerate. I mean, they they accelerate their uh, acclimation into the environment, um, you know, at a faster rate than than some. But the idea is, 
we don't believe that. It's just like the teachers, it's my role to help them acclimate. I think just the, the other learners being who they are and those other learners encouraging them to take risks, they also help those learners to accl acclimate. And those learners um, who are new, just the fact that they really wanna be successful and want to learn um, eventually will take those risks and just be part of the environment. Since we equate it often, and Kevin, I get this from you, we tell learners, it's like a conversation. Like if you walked up to a group of people having a conversation and you just missed part of the conversation, you naturally would kind of just weave them right in, maybe catch them up on a couple of things and then just keep having your conversation. And, and, and that's, you know, part of how we explain it to people who are coming in. Um, definitely, you know, as they're joining an ongoing community, and then as learners enter for the first time, you know, in a classroom where they're they're asked to explain their thinking, it's really it's a really fun transformation to watch. You know, I'm thinking about you know putting a problem up on the board, and you know the, those first early days, you know, we've had learners. I'm thinking of Louie, Mr. Moore, coming up to the board and just writing down the answer, and then sitting down, and then we're like, um, how did you get that? But say more, and him suddenly realizing, oh, like I have people here who want to hear what I have to say, and that being a little bit shocking for them to to have being asked and being you know expected to provide more information and rather than just giving an answer, and how that just shows how different the culture is around math experience. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, the deep emphasis on the final answer. Um, pushes lots of learners, like it, um, because it's not the answer provides us nothing. <laughs> it provides us nothing. Um, we have to understand the thought behind that answer to even determine whether that answer is a reasonable one. So you know, de-emphasizing the answer and placing emphasis on the thought that leads to an answer, the reasoning that leads to the answer, it, it helps. Um, it helps with engaging learners in this work. Hmm. I love that you guys continue to refer to yourselves and the students as learners um, because it sets you in a place of humility, which is a foundation of all learning, that we need to be humble. And I think that's a really, really core virtue that's important in all schools. So I appreciate greatly that you call your students learners. I think that's beautiful and your teachers learners. Um, one of the things that I don't think our listeners could even grasp without having a visit to your school is the extremely high complex level of math that these students are doing. And it's hard to imagine how, I couldn't even believe when I saw it, the complexity of the problems that you put on the board and then you step back and allow them to come up and solve it. It, it almost seems like from an outsider who didn't look in, you're not doing any teaching. Like how in the world are these kids actually figuring this out? And I think part of it goes back to one, there is a deep seated reality inside of us as human beings that we can figure things out. That's one, one thing. And I think that's what kind of Paul Lockhart is getting in the mathematician's lament is it's a game and it's interesting. And, and we, we are very intelligent beings so we can figure things out. I also love the idea that as community, you can figure it out better and quicker. That makes sense to me. But I don't think our listeners have a clue. Like what I saw happening, I mean, the, the Kaylee, your students were what, between eight and 10? Yes. And they were doing stuff that like, I don't think I've ever done, like really high level math. <laughs> and it blew me away. And I'm like, I could never have figured that out. But yet, if I were a kid again in a classroom like that, I probably would have engaged. And I also loved how when you broke the kids into small groups where they were partner learning and together discussing one problem, whichever student was writing on the board, the other person was telling. So the one person was writing while the other student was actually dictating the thought process. I thought that was a very interesting partnership and good, interesting way of learning. Um, yeah. But I, I think it getting at the essence of how you guys are approaching math if I remember, it has to do with how you define number, how you define place value. So there's kind of this underlying philosophy of how you approach the language of math in order to give the students the right 
ideas so that they can actually do the solving. Mm -hmm. right? Am I right there? Well, I think it's it, it, because we we see math um, through as these you know interconnected ideas, you know, this network of ideas. We really focus on math conceptually. So as opposed to you know having learners remember rules and facts and apply um, equations or I'm sorry apply formulas or solve equations very procedurally we really try to think about what are the ideas that we want our learners to explore. And those, these ideas connect across mathematics. Right? So, so we're not teaching them these discrete skills that you know, have been um, determined to be skills for first graders or second graders or third graders. So we step back and we look at the discipline of mathematics and we look for the connecting ideas, the ideas that are connected. So we, and we teach toward those ideas. And if we're teaching toward those ideas, there are rarely any new concepts or new um, uh, concepts in mathematics. There are new understandings of those concepts, but there's really any new concept. So, for example, we start with something uh, when we when we um, uh, with our early uh, learners, we think about number as an idea, as opposed to this thing that we're going to manipulate. And so thinking about number as an idea, it really helps us to continue to build this idea. And as we build this idea, kids just have a much more, uh, they, they understand how complex number is and all of the different, you know, really complex ways that you can express a number, but it's still related to the same idea, that, that foundational idea of number. So we, we find these connective ideas and we grow those ideas with every experience, um, with every way in which we try to engage learners in mathematics, we're only continuing to deepen their understandings of these really fundamental ideas. Yeah, and I, I think another thing to, to add to that is that you are extremely good at asking good questions. So in order to get the student to think about number, you ask some very profound questions about what a number is to help guide them towards how to think about number in a way that allows this collaborative learning. Am I correct? That's what That's I right. saw. Okay. Yes. And that question, and I, and there's many questions, but one of the core questions I think in our work is what are you counting? And so that's really getting at kind of a, a lot of what Kevin's saying from the very beginning to really understand number in this really powerful way that connects, um, you know, to, to many concepts is to consider that there's actually a count. So there's this idea that when I see a number such as five, for example, that you actually have a count of ones there. And so to think of five as a count of ones and that you have five of them, and then that on its own can, you know, transcend all number forms. So we can think no matter what we have, we can ask ourselves, well, what are we counting? Right. And, and it connects, like, the, the, like that basic understanding of what you are counting helps you to understand, well, that is then how we define a whole number, five holes, five ones. So we understand that, that like that's a very basic understanding of numbers. So then I can, then from that, I see that five can be expressed as five times one or five of one. So we're like, there, there are lots of things that just come from that really basic understanding of understanding that five is a count of something. It helps us then to understand this context of numbers belonging to sets, such as whole numbers, and that you can express a number like five in a different way. So we've, we've, we've covered a lot of math territory just yeah. with that very basic understanding and, and continue to engage num uh, learners in this way around number helps us then to continue to deepen their understanding of this these very basic ideas substitution um of uh, number sets and all of these things mm -hmm. i think that's good i i have a math question since we're on the subject can two plus two ever equal five 
uh, and we go back to what uh, Kaylee said, it's the question is, so what are we counting when we say two? Are we saying two ones? Are we talking about two fourths? Are we talking about two? So the question is, and are, do they have to be like terms? So if I have two, uh, I can have two fourths and two thirds. Right. So when we ask ourselves, what are those terms expressing? What do what are they counting? What are they enumerating? Then it is very possible that it might be that. that I see. So 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 you want them to uh, be very precise for their language. And so I would imagine that you would want more than just two plus two. You'd want two something plus two something. Is that is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. OK. And this is why eight year old we're able to wrestle with decimals and fractions in their classroom because that basic question and understanding is there. It's so cool. I wish I were a kid in your classes. <laughs> it was so beautiful. I felt like my mind was just blowing. It was just like, wow. And I, and I realized I went up to Kathy afterwards and I said, oh my goodness, the, the reason I can't do math today is because I don't remember any of the formulas. And I realized I never learned to think about it this way. If I had learned to think about it this way, the formulas don't matter. It was just, it was very, it, a very light bulb moment for me. So, um, so yeah, go ahead. I'm curious to know for, for teachers who are not uh, living near you and, and capable of just coming on board and teaching math uh, through your school, uh, how might one consider adopting or implementing some of your, some of your practices in in a, in a math classroom where let's say the math teacher is listening to this and saying okay yes i want to incorporate this um but of course they are working in a larger system with certain expectations of what math is and what math isn't and it it, it may strike a math teacher as, as a real up, uphill battle uh what what would be a good starting place and how could they sort of implement this slowly into their classroom well you know i I always think about, you know, the the when we when we work with teachers and we talk about practice first. And I I, I often want to push back on the, the the practice piece because I think that the first thing that really has to change is your thinking about teaching and learning. I remember sitting um in a discussion years ago with uh, some colleagues. And uh, I remember one colleague saying um, that, you know, he, he just made this, you know, this really emphatic statement. He said, you know, there's no teaching, there's only learning. And at that moment, it was, that was such a radical idea to me. Um, like there's no teaching, there's only learning. That's all, we, and we should be focused on learning. And, and this was years ago and it was a radical idea and I wasn't really, and it was intriguing to me but I wasn't really ready to accept that idea that there was no teaching because after all, I spent all of my time trying to be a better teacher. You know, for me, teaching was about instruction. So I think that, uh, and I'm, and my, my reason for uh, using that example is I wasn't ready to accept that because I was still thinking about practice and I wasn't really thinking about teaching as a, as a different idea. Um, engaging learners as a different, I wasn't thinking about that as a different idea yet. And what I really want to uh, um, encourage teachers to do first is to really think about what it is that they believe about teaching and learning and to begin to think about how can that understanding of teaching and learning, how could, how could that be different? How could there be a different way of seeing teaching and learning? Um, and then being open to understanding that teaching and learning can have, can, can, or what I understand about teaching and learning can have different practices, right? Because there can be different thought around teaching and learning that lead to different practices. Um, because I've often seen people try to emulate something that they didn't really have understanding for. And so it didn't come out <laughs> the way that it could have had they had a better understanding. So I really like to push back on teachers to think about what it is that they're trying to accomplish as teachers, um, what is their understanding of teaching and learning, what are, you know, and, and then to think about, could I have, could I have a different way of experience, could my learners have a different way of experiencing learning in a classroom situation, and, and be open to uh, these different ways of exploring, because just as you said about like, well, can two and two be five, I have to be open to that possibility. 
right? To even explore that, to even entertain that, I have to be open to that. And I think that openness as learners, that teachers first go back to becoming learners and start thinking about what can I learn as a teacher? What can I learn as an individual that will help me become a better teacher, a better learner? So I think that first, I'd really like teachers to just reconsider like what it is that I'm learning and what what it is that I'm what it what is it first that I'm doing what am I trying to accomplish and could that be done better could that be done differently could I have a, do, a new understanding about the work that I do yes yeah, so I think you're certainly on to uh, many good things there and one of the things that I want to reaffirm is uh reimagining or rethinking what's even going on in the classroom and and what, what you're trying to do there together um before you try to imitate some practice or try to plug some practice in. Uh, one of the things that Adrian and I oftentimes try to return our listeners to and, and in our community of people who are thinking through uh, this, this renewal of education, we try to think a lot about principles because mm -hmm. it seems to me that if you have the principles, um, if you're thinking in principles, then the practices are going to start to kind of become clear depending on who's in front of you. Uh, definitely, definitely, and and um, and then you have something to measure it against. Am am I meeting those principles? Right? Am I am I doing the work that necessarily keeps me honest about what it is that I say that I'm trying to accomplish? And we work with teachers in the summer, and of course, as we step away from our classrooms and get to come together in the summer to work on you know, considering our assumptions and beginning to, to, you know, examine our own thinking together. That's part of the work that we do as we, as we work with um, educators in the summertime. And then, and then we really hope to help provide a vision for helping them to see that it could look different. So for me, you know, one of the biggest things in order to help teachers to move closer to something different is you first have to see it. You have to be able to have some sort of vision to what else it could be. And so we do hope that that's part of the work that we do is to, you know, provide that vision and that, you know, sight line to something different. And then to actually have teachers experience it differently for themselves and by engaging them as learners during our summer professional development and asking them to really you know, not only unpack their assumptions and consider their culture, um, but, but also just to be a learner and get to experience something much different than maybe what they're getting to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so that's an important piece of, you know, the, the work that we, that we engage with teachers in in the summertime. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about your professional development program. Um, one thing that, I, that comes to mind just with working with a lot of schools is I'd like to see more board members, parents, and headmasters go to your program because that's where it starts, to be honest with you, for teachers to attend. I think it's great, and I know that the school I work for, um, you guys came in last year to work with them, and it helped a lot with, you know, the, I, I know your program, you, you pretty much say we're teaching you how to think differently, so it doesn't really matter what curriculum you're using. But at the same time, you know, we're working in these schools where it's grades, K, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five. And, and I would really love to see your program be embraced by school boards <laughs> so that they can actually make this happen in a full school and have everybody on board. So if anybody's listening that's on the school board, a headmaster, please go to their professional development. Um, I'd like you guys to share more about that. It's the, called the Number Lab, right? Yes. And I, I, as I've looked at your website and I've spoken with my boss who loves you guys, that's how I have found out about you. And I work at a classical school. Um, your philosophy of good professional development is right in line with, with mine and what I believe in. And um, I think I, I would be at your professional development this summer if I weren't out of town doing professional development at another school. <laughs> So tell, tell our listeners about that. I don't know if you have any openings. It's coming up, right? But I don't know if it's full. So, um, Well, I think we do have, um, we still have openings, um, but it is, it is filling quickly. Um, 
But the, the, the goal of our professional development is what Kaylee said. It's really to get teachers to envision to uh, that math could be experienced differently and not just differently. It's not just an alternative. It is a way really to engage learners so that learners actually are engaged as mathematicians. They are engaged in the work of really doing some deep thinking around mathematics. So it's not just an alternative. It really is trying to see how we can optimize learning. Um, and so what we try to do is we try to talk about some of the theory that underlies this. So, um, you know, what what is it that we understand about teaching and learning that directs our work? And then we move into, um, well, let's experience some of that. Let's you as a teacher, um, by engaging in um, a, a, as a mathematician yourself, um, experience what it would be like to be in a space where you are asked to, you know, um, take risk, uh, make conjectures, have those uh, um, conjectures then be um, so validated by peers um, and, you know, just be uncomfortable, <laughs> um, get messy and uh, and see what can come of such a rich, really learning um, experience. So it is, yes, definitely having opportunity to understand some of the, 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 the theory and the, the background information, but it's also engaging as a mathematician yourself and seeing the power of that engagement. And we see that teaching is this really hard and should be, you know, um, important, it's such important work. Um, but that what we think about with our PD is that we really want to engage teachers as learners, as Kevin's saying, um, but to also know that what, what our PD is not, it's not just this simplified do this one thing and it will fix everything or, um, you know, a recipe for the perfect classroom. That's not how we're seeing it. We actually embrace all the complexity that teaching is. And we believe that this is hard, sustained work that needs to happen over time. And that we hope that we can continue to provide that work over, over time. And that it's not just going to be this one three day intensive. That's going to change everything. It's just going to be the beginning to a much longer journey because we know that it's that this is ongoing work. It's ongoing work for us, and we live it every single day. And so we hope to, you know, continue to provide that support. And and we're also moving into uh, finding new ways to um, to provide that support for teachers. We're kind of answering the question that we often get from teachers after our fabulous three days together, saying, "Wait, but now I wish that you were in my classroom with me. Wait, I want to keep doing this work." And so we're actually adding on an online platform where we're going to be sharing more widely our work and adding resources and support for teachers. And that will be under um, long-view-learning.com is going to be um, launching um, in the next month or so. And we're going to be able to continue to keep in touch with our community in that way to adding, adding content and resources for them there. Now, is that only available for people who attend the professional development? No, and we, we hope that, you know, we imagine that it's going to likely be, um, you know, that those will be our people coming in initially, but we do hope that it's more wide reaching and that, you know, and people can, can use it in many different ways. But again, we do see that the work is deeper and ongoing and it's, um, so it might be a combination of, of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we've talked in some detail about what success looks like, and I think it's a really beautiful vision. I'm wondering, what does it look like when a student fails? Or, uh, and I imagine it has something to do with not fully engaging within uh, what the community is is up to. Um, but could you could you speak in more detail about what it looks like when, when for for one reason or the other, um, the the student just doesn't engage or doesn't um, go through the the process of learning that we've that we've laid out and described here. Well, what I think it it looks like is lots of conversations with that learner uh, about like, um, you know, what is it that they want from um, their learning environment and also um, understanding that they have something to offer, even if oftentimes they don't see that they have something to offer. And so for, for lots of learners, for us, usually um, 
you know, failure is part of the learning experience. And what it really, for us, um, symbolizes is just really that's where, or signifies, I should say, is that where is that's where a learner is, right? It's not where they will always be. It is, it's where they are in the moment. And for us, there's, there's coaching required. So what is it that, what, what is it that we need a learner to do to begin to move them in the direction that we believe that they can go? And so, again, as I said before, it's conversations with them. It's conversations that the teacher has with them. It's conversations that their peers have with them. Those conversations happen in the moment. They can happen, you know, outside of the class. Um, but it is constant conversation. And it's a re and most of the time learners don't engage in those ways. It's really, it is because of fear. Um, they are hesitant. Um, they fear not saying the right thing or doing the right thing. And what they have to understand is we all feel that way. And and what and no one is expecting um, someone to be accurate 100% of the time. Um, learning isn't about what we think. It's not exactly what, it's not about being accurate. It's not about being right, but it's uh, uh, about learning to, um, as I said, share something and share something reasonable and seeing where it takes us. So again, you know, the failure usually comes when learners are, you know, not as willing to engage. And it's not, it doesn't even have to just be the verbal um, because there are certain learners who are certainly much more, um, verbal and um, their participation verbally is uh, much greater than some, but even the active listening, because we have learners who will go and work with their peers and their peers will say, well, we talked about that. It didn't seem like you were listening. So, um, and holding them accountable for that. So the, the active critical participation, which is not just the verbal, but the active listening um, and having conversations to get them to understand that that's their role as a learner and not just for them, but for the community. And that's an important part of, I think, our work. And I think something that's been so transformative for me is just the, the deep level of trust that we have for, for young people. And that the, you know, that we that that kind of communicates in so many different ways by having that um, you know, deep-seated trust in them. And when something doesn't feel like it's quite working, which you know are, we have we have very normal kids, and yes, that happens often. And there's things that don't work quite right, but it's this reframe. It's I'm asking myself a very different question than when I maybe was in a different classroom setting. Maybe I previously would ask myself, well, <laughs> there's something wrong. You know, they're doing something wrong, or what's the child? You know, that there's a problem there, or there's a behavior. And instead now the questions that I'm asking myself are what's going on for them? Like there's, there must be something underneath that. Something's not quite working right now in this moment or what can I do to connect with them or help them feel their sense of belonging? And Kevin, I love how you named it as, you know, they have, they might not see it for themselves yet, but that that's part of our work. And we see that as an important piece is to really, you know, know them deeply you know, help them to find their way and to, because they do, they, they all want to belong. We're a community. And that's, I think, for all of us, when we're part of a community, we all want to, to belong to that community in so many ways. And so I think that that's part of our work and our effort in, in our, you know, as teachers. I think that's beautiful. And I, I definitely saw that in my visit. It is very strong. The culture is beautiful. The communication is excellent. The humane way of treating one another is is very very beautiful. I think it's it's awesome that you have longer class periods because you can go deeper with ish, deeper and without having just a you know forty minute lesson with an objective up on the board that you have to cover. You actually can go into the heart of the student as well, and um, it shows. And you guys have nice long little recesses in between. And I, I, I love the structure of your whole program. I think it's beautiful. Um, what we'd like to conclude with is uh, a question, giving our listeners some book recommendations. So you can either uh, tell our listeners what book you wish you had read sooner in your life. It doesn't have to do with math. It could be anything. <laughs> or uh, what book do you recommend to our listeners to help them understand this message today? Well, in terms of understanding the message today, and, and 
I think, uh, which is learner centeredness for us, like we really adhere to this idea of being focused on the learner. Therefore, we can be focused on learning. And so um, I would recommend the book Learner Centered Teaching um, by Mary Ellen Weimer. And it really, uh, for us, gave us the, the language, um, a, a coherent way of understanding the work that we're really doing. So uh, Learner Centered uh, Teaching is, I think, um, a great way to uh, better understand our philosophy here at Longview. Okay, Kaylee. Yeah, I think so many books come to mind for me, um, you know, for me trying to move as a teacher, one that was significant in my experience was I had read actually just before meeting um, Kevin and, and uh, the folks at Longview um, was actually Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. And it was just, um, you know, it, it just happened to, I read that book and then met these folks and realized for myself Okay, I can do this. It was that like move towards vulnerability, move towards kind of coming back to, um, you know, recognizing within myself that I, you know, I can move towards something, something more um, and getting to see then the example of what learning could be um, was really powerful for me. So I, that's the initial book that came to mind. But then another that might be really valuable, I think, for educators as they're beginning to think in, the, in these different ways um, was, it would be um, the by John Hattie um, is Visible Learning. It talks a lot about feedback and really um, the importance of, you know, just uh, of feedback in the classroom. And really, um, I think there's a couple versions. There's maybe one about the math classroom in particular, but then just in general. And, and both of those by John Hattie, I, I highly recommend. Okay. Thank you guys so much for having us on or for coming on to our show and having me out to visit. It's great. Yeah, thank you so much for being with such us. This is really wonderful. Yes, such a pleasure having you here. And thank you for this opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>